Good morning, and thank you for joining us for Think Time Tuesdays with today's focus on story selling and the freestyle practice. Now, first of all, I wanted to thank Corinne Ellingson, Carlo Cacavale, T.B. Rothman, and the AIA Los Angeles chapter for setting this event up. So join me and my guest, brand strategist and creative consultant, Lisa Buckering, as we dive into today's topic. Let me tell you a little bit more about myself. My name is Elizabeth Sporer. I am a licensed architect and a trained and certified integral co coach. I work as a brand strategist, a management consultant, and as a leadership coach. If you want to know more about my thinking, you can uh, sign up to receive my monthly newsletters or connect with me via the LinkedIn um, QR code that I show. Over the past 25 years or so, I've been part of about 30 firms. First in, uh, as a team leader, as a team as a project designer, then part of the project management teams, and then the firm leadership teams, and then as a firm owner, and right now as a consultant to A and D firm leadership teams. Now my approach working with clients combines business strategy with leadership coaching, which I find uh, very, to be very successful. Lisa Bokarin is a brand marketing and communication strategist. We met while working at EHD, a San Francisco based architecture firm, while I was director of practice and she was uh, director of marketing. Since then, I've brought Lisa on board for projects with some of my AD clients, ranging from uh, business strategy sessions to rebranding of, project, of, of projects and firms. She's also my brand coach at SoArc, offering content strategy and content development of some of my events and newsletters. Now, the four, four Think Time Tuesday events continue the dialogue. I started in 2019 with a series of presentations offering fresh perspectives. And these are some of the events that led up to Think Time Tuesdays. So the four business plan basics of brand, operations, finance, and design, and the firm profiles of entrepreneur, Maverick, and legacy firm create a thread throughout the TTT series. The blueprint for success event lays out the baseline in more depth. A recording of it can be found on my website, and I'll give you a link via the chat. So I hope you, can, you will join me to explore the four topics of brand, operations, finance, and design throughout the TTT series. And attendance will inspire and guide you to build or fine tune your own business plan. The upcoming leadership uh, event in May will lay open how, basic, how, how business structure, culture, and firm management are intertwined with business consult, uh, with um, leadership coaching and a business plan. Now, when it comes to firm profiles, the dots on this map indicate firms I am and have been working with. It maps the three firm profiles of the entrepreneur, the Maverick, and the legacy firm that emerged based on my experience. Again, there, more of that can be seen in, in the video I mentioned. Taking time and planning for think time is essential to creative business planning. Some of you have asked me now, is Think Time Tuesday a weekly event? Yes, it should be for each one of you. However, I will facilitate four events only, one each quarter. And with that said, I welcome Lisa Bokarian to tell us more about what brand does or mean and its impact on a firm's business development, marketing and PR styles and effort. Lisa, it's all yours. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Elizabeth, for uh, having me. So I just want to build on what Corinne said about the learning unit. This session has four learning objectives that will be woven into the presentation. So there won't be a specific section for each learning objective. It'll be uh, the learning objectives will be fulfilled holistically throughout the session. And this session is in three parts. First part will be an overview with uh, three interactive segments for the audience to participate in. I will go over branding, storytelling, and story selling. 
Second uh, section is case studies where I will spend most of the presentation and where Elizabeth and I will have conversation points. And then I will wrap up with a section on values where we will talk about budget, visual assets, and what's next. So what's in a name? Your logo is perhaps the most succinct and visible expression of your brand. And when I think about branding and logos, I think about cattle ranchers and how they brand their livestock to indicate probably three things, ownership, authenticity, and origin. In the same way, your brand can convey and capture those three things. And most uh, brands uh, will comprise of a, a logo lock that will include a, an icon or a word mark. In this case, the Zoom logo lock contains both. But for me, and I don't know how many other people think this way, I associate Zoom, Zoom more with its word mark than the actual um, icon. In contrast, when I think of YouTube, I don't think of the logo lock, which you're seeing here now, but rather I think of YouTube in terms of just the play button. And your logo can also be a date stamp. And what do I mean by that? It can be literal in that your logo lock could actually contain the year that your firm was established. Or in a more evocative way, I will show you three examples. These are three Los Angeles based brands. Uh, all will have uh, word marks for their logo. And Los Angeles Times, uh, if you notice their word mark consists of a very, very classic, one might even say traditional, very old school font style. And to me, this conveys the gravitas that comes with being a national newspaper. In fact, I believe the Los Angeles Times is the only newspaper, major newspaper not headquartered in the East Coast. And it also conveys the stature that the Los Angeles Times has among the pantheon of uh, other national newspapers and that it is ranked fifth, I believe, in terms of circulation. Now, when you look at a brand, James Purse, which is a lifestyle clothing brand, it has a sans serif font, which has a little bit heavier uh, line weight to the fonts. And this to me reads modern, a little bit relaxed, and uh, there's a level of sophistication and style associated with that font style. And also it might mean, when I say modern, it might mean a brand that is has been more recently founded versus Los Angeles Times, which was founded 150 plus years ago, if I'm not mistaken, perhaps longer. And then you have Fred Seagal, Seagal um, which is a very iconic LA brand. If you notice the font style is a little bit more playful, you're seeing the introduction of color. And that to me is very evocative. It's very desert. It's like a party, but in a very kind of stylish and sophisticated way. Think of cocktail hour for some reason when I see this logo. So that takes us to our first survey. What's in your name? And by your name, I mean your brand name, your logo, your logo lock. Does it consist only of an icon, a word mark, or does it have both? We'll give you a few um, seconds to respond there. Drum roll, please. Oh, both. Interesting. Thank you. When we were rehearsing yesterday, I had my own guess about which one was going to be the, the dominant answer. And um, your response this morning is a surprise. And it kind of, I need to have another segue for my next slide. Just kidding. So thank you for that. So most of you have both a logo uh, uh, icon and a word mark in your logo. That's interesting. 
So what's the storytelling style as conveyed solely by a logo? What I'm about to show you is typically part of brand strategy work that I do for clients, specifically the marketplace survey portion of the brand strategy. And what I have done for purposes of this presentation is I surveyed logos uh, by brands of brands in the built environment, mostly A and D firms, but also I've included a couple of landscape design firms and a construction firm. And based on those, that survey, I uh, identified five storytelling styles just solely on their logos. And then to that, I've layered a survey of sorts, a general uh, read on the evolution of naming conventions specific to architecture and design firms. So the five storytelling styles are straightforward, creative, philosophical, provocative, and whimsical. Now, what does straightforward mean? And this is Marmel Radzner, which is an LA-based firm. It means that firms based on their logo are telling the story about its founders. So in this case, it's two founders. An evolution of this can be seen with EYRC, another Los Angeles-based firm and this time, instead of the name spelled out, you have the first letters of the last names of the founders. That to me is interesting because EYRC for me almost reads like a word. So while this is still a straightforward uh, storytelling style, it's infused a little bit with uh, creativity, whether that's intentional or not, I think it's, it's quite clever. Now going into the uh, closer to the creative storytelling style is SHOP, which is an architecture and design firm out of New York. And SHOP happens to spell the initials of the last names of the founders, who also coincidentally are Elizabeth's fellow alums from Columbia University. So there must be something in the uh, creative water up there. And you have uh, Sam Architects, which is a younger architecture and design firm out of the UK. And Sam is actually not the first letters of the last names. I think it's just the name that resulted from the initials of the founders' names. So you're going into the more creative realm there. And then uh, for storytelling styles that are really more on the creative side, you have part office. And then you have Realm, which is a landscape architecture firm based in Los Angeles that was rebranded from Melendris. And I think one of their principals, David, is uh, in the audience this morning. So Happy David, welcome uh, on you. Elizabeth's yes. uh, invitation. Thank you for yeah. joining us. Of course, thank you for inviting. So Realm, when you think about Realm, you think of kingdom, you think of land. So it's a very creative going into the almost philosophical storytelling style in that landscape and land is actually the canvas for landscape architects to create. Here's another landscape architecture firm based in Los Angeles, Abe, which was founded by Calvin Abe. His name, last name is spelled A-B-E. And at first blush, I thought, oh, is the uh, firm derived, the firm name derived from his last name? And it very well could be. I never got to ask him that question. But if you look at their logo lock, Abe actually stands for the firm's design philosophy on landscape architecture. Going uh, in the same vein as a philosophical storytelling style, you have Red Dot Studio out of San Francisco. And when you think of red dots, they're quite ubiquitous while at the same time being quite symbolic. And then you have what I consider probably the firm that started it all in terms of philosophical naming, or at least in the most visible way is INEAD, which uh, was rebranded from Polshek Partners. And you think of INEAD, it means group of nine. So if you look at the storytelling style from the straightforward um, uh, section of this page, it's about people and the founders, whereas INEAD, it's about a collective or it starts to suggest the idea of a collective. Now, in more contemporary times, you have, I've identified a couple of storytelling styles. 
whimsical, and I'll give you examples of that. Tres Birds is out of Colorado, an architecture and design firm. And Husband and Wife is out of New York. Now, in terms of my, my research for this page, I discovered that the provocative storytelling style seems to be um, what happens more in Los Angeles. It seems to be, I don't wanna say hotbed, but I did find two uh, brands that I think best capture a provocative storytelling style, and they happen to be both LA based. So you have Dirty Girl Construction and you have Design Bitches. And look at their logo locks. You're starting to see, or in, in a comparison to the other logos I've shown so far, the logo locks include the um, icon. Now there are firms that have transcended their origins in terms of a straightforward storytelling style. And when you think, when I think about these brands and look at their logos, I no longer think of a straightforward storytelling style. Instead, I think of a very versatile storytelling style, which is not um, easy to accomplish. And I'm talking about these three firms in particular, Gensler, SOM, and HOK. This page, by the way, is dedicated to the graphic designers in the audience and those of you who are logo design enthusiasts. So that takes us to the second survey. What is your storytelling style? And you might have a combination, but let's think about what's more dominant right now for you. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, okay. Did you expect that, Lisa? Oh, <laughs> uh, I, I think I was. People cannot see the results, so you have to explain what the, the outcome is. Oh, excuse me, sorry. So um, straightforward is 52%, philosophical is 13%. Provocative is nine is uh, zero, creative is twenty nine, and whimsical is six. This is probably to answer your question, Elizabeth. It's probably in keeping with the fact that architecture is a professional services that that deals with more serious matters. So the idea of a whimsical um, storytelling style is probably not in keeping with most of the architecture firms' um, paths. However, it's a trend that you uncovered and I see it also happening more. Yeah, yeah. So thank you for participating, everyone. So now that we've established, at least for purposes of this session, that logos can be a powerful storytelling tool, how are architecture and design stories sold? In my client work and in-house um, work on staff, I've come to the conclusion that architecture and design stories are sold in two general ways, through business development and through marketing. And notice I've chosen a runner to symbolize business development because business development like running is in pursuit of something, you're in pursuit of a project. Whereas marketing, I've chosen the uh, yoga warrior two pose, which for yoga practitioners, means this pose is a very powerful, grounded, yet elevating and an uplifting pose. So in marketing, when you're doing marketing, you are positioning yourself for work instead of pursuing work. Now we can't talk about marketing without talking about PR because they're very closely intertwined. And I've chosen the, this particular yoga pose because many years ago, a wise person told me, explained to me the difference between marketing and PR. And this person said to me, marketing is results you pay for, whereas PR is results you pray for. 
And those wise words, I think, are still true today. So what's the story selling mix? It really depends. It depends on your goals. It depends on your budget. It depends uh, probably more importantly also on your bandwidth as the owner of a firm or as a principal that is tasked with overseeing marketing, PR and business development. And it depends on where you are, where your firm is in its life cycle. But let's look at four goals and um, I'll show you the four uh, story selling mixes with, that come along with these goals. Start a firm, create buzz, grow, gain prestige. Now, when you're starting a firm, your story selling mix is probably, but not always, most likely it's going to be very marketing forward. You might be doing a little bit of business development, but the PR efforts are probably not the dominant um, effort here in part because you may not have stories to share, i.e. projects to share. When you're creating buzz, if that's the goal, this is a very uh, PR forward story selling mix, assuming you have a good marketing foundation to ensure the success of your PR investment. There's a little bit of brand uh, of, of uh, business development that's going on, but in terms of your time, the effort, the focus, uh, PR is going to be the, the dominant um, area of activity. If the goal is growth, then you are focused on business development and your marketing initiatives and efforts are really being done to support the growth goal. There may or may not be any uh, PR activity. And when the goal is to gain prestige, then the story selling mix might be a double tracking of marketing and PR while you're still doing business development. And I will say these are just four examples. Part of the reason the name of this session is uh, freestyle practice is because once you've learned the basics, the freestyling comes in how you mix and match things, depending again on the um, factors that I mentioned, your goal, your budget, your bandwidth, and where you are, where your firm is in its life cycle. So that takes us to our final survey for you. What is your story selling style? Is it more BD dominant? Is it more marketing dominant? Is it more PR dominant? Mm, that's oh, an interesting okay. outcome. <laughs> yeah. Although I think when we were talking yesterday, Elizabeth, that we, I don't know if we mentioned that this was probably going to be the, so business development as the story selling style, 56%, uh, PR 24%, marketing 21%. Thank you. It's very interesting. I, yeah. I didn't expect that. <laughs> Thanks for participating. So let's go into case studies. I am going to share five case studies with you. First up is um, if the goal is starting a firm and this is a hypothetical firm. So when you're starting a firm, as I mentioned earlier, you're probably going to have a story selling mix that's more marketing dominant with some business development going on and probably not a lot of PR activity at this, this, at this point. So starting a firm can result from solo projects and or collaborations that lead to a competition that you're, you're, you win with a friend or a commission, for example, for residential architects and designers, a family friend or a family member commissions you to do their house or a client decides to come with you um, to start your practice. While this is going on, you might be thinking about what your firm name might be. In this case, the hypothet hypothetical firm name is No Name Studio. And you're thinking about all these things, your website, email address, you're trying, trying to line up your visual assets, your copy assets. And hopefully you're also, most importantly, thinking about a business plan, which is where Elizabeth comes in because business strategy is what um, 
enables the creation of a sound business plan. And a sound business plan is the foundation for a marketing plan, which at the end of the day, your marketing plan should be in service to your business plan to help you achieve your business goals. So this is one way to start a firm. Some people might already have a vision for a firm in architecture and design school, and they already know how to what they want to put out in the marketplace, but they may not have projects or they may not have a budget. And what can they do? Maybe they'll start a presence on social media and have an Instagram feed that may not show projects, but it'll show their design thinking and their design philosophy in a very visual appealing way. And then eventually a website might, might result from that. And this, the takeaway for me from this hypothetical case study, it is um, easier, more easy, more easy than ever to start a firm, I call a pop-up firm, because uh, online has enabled that. So you don't no longer need to think about resources such as a physical office when you want to start a firm. This is the first of three case studies around creating buzz. So PR, dominant story selling styles. This is Tipping Structural Engineers, which is a preeminent structural engineering firm headquartered in Berkeley. I'm showing the client team and I was the consultant team. And you will note as we progress through these case studies that the client team and consultant team will both increase in size as a reflection really of the goals and uh, what it takes to reach those goals. In Tipping's case, their goal was pretty straightforward. They had a new headquarters that they wanted to uh, get published. And this new headquarters embodied the best of their creative thinking around um, structural engineering specific to earthquakes. And so the target audience were their peers, colleagues and potential clients. So the goal was editorial uh, placement. And this was a short-term engagement. I believe it was a three-month engagement. And we, I successfully placed the founder in the San Francisco Business Times through a profile in print. And there was also an accompanying video story on the uh, Business Times website. As well, the project was covered in the San Francisco Chronicle in an article written by its urban design critic, John King. So the takeaway from this case study is you can use PR and invest in PR um, sporadically as long as it's strategic. This next case study involves Red Dot Studio, which is a woman owned firm in San Francisco, fewer than 10 employees. And uh, if you remember Elizabeth's firm profile slide, they would be an entrepreneurial firm. So the goal here, similarly to tipping, was to publish a project that was going to really take the firm to that next level. So it was a very important project for them. Again, this is the client team. And you'll note that the consultant team is a little bit um, it was bigger than what Tipping's team was. And this was an 18 month engagement. And the reason that it took that long is before I could even start pitching the project, um, we had to look at how the firm was presenting itself online. Now the goal of the firm was to get one project published in print in Dwell Magazine, which is an aspirational goal for many firms. But the founder, Karen, was um, committed to making, uh, to, to doing what it took to get the project published. And again, that included revisiting how the firm presents itself online, specifically on their website. So we went through a website redesign. And the reason for that is when a project is being pitched to an editor, most likely they're going to want to check out your website. And what I tell clients is when they get to your website, you want them to find what you want them to find instead of, oh, it's an old website or this doesn't really feel like it's the website of this architect, the work doesn't look like the website or whatever conclusions or observations they might make. So in this case, we did a website redesign and um, Karen hired Joe Fletcher to photograph the project. And Joe Fletcher is a very uh, accomplished, well-published photographer 
because she knew that his photography could help her get the project in well. It made my job certainly easier. So we succeeded in getting editorial placement. I think the project ended up getting a six page spread. The article was written by Joanne Furio, who is a writer based in the Bay Area. Now, because this was such a long process from pitch to placement, this meant that the project had to be embargoed on the side of the client. And what does that mean? It means you can't post on your blog, you can't show on social media, and if there are any consultants involved in the project, they can't do anything else until that big goal is achieved, which in this case it was. And so it provided good content for Red Dot Studio for their Instagram feed and their blog. Now here's a case study of creating buzz, but if you'll notice the story selling mix is a little bit different. And here's where the free styling comes in based on the need. This is EHDD, where as Elizabeth mentioned, our professional paths first crossed. She was director of practice and I was a marketing director with an in-house marketing team. And this was the consultant team. Now, the original goal here was to get four projects published. The firm, which is at, at the time, I think it was 60 years old, maybe 62 years old. And they had won numerous design awards, including two major AIA awards. So they were a very established legacy firm with a um, great reputation. And they had four projects coming online that they wanted to publicize, <clears throat> excuse me. In the course of thinking on a PR strategy, we realized that there was a milestone that was coming up. I believe it was the 65th anniversary of the firm's founding was coming up. And so we thought about that and how to incorporate that into the story selling. And that led to the decision to do a full rebrand. So this is a case study where a PR goal actually led to a full rebrand and that this logo that you're seeing is the result of that uh, rebranding. So this was a multi-year effort. The rebranding effort itself took about 18 months from start to finish, in part because there were a lot of stakeholders. And when you're dealing with a legacy firm with a very deep portfolio, it can be very hard to curate the projects. And also uh, the marketing team was still going ahead with uh, operations as usual, meaning that we were still doing business development, business development support, as well as continuing with marketing initiatives. So I'm going to show you just a selection of results. So the projects in question, the four projects ended up getting published. I believe one of them, the Packard headquarters ended up on the cover of Green Source. In terms of award submissions, the firm landed on the San Francisco Business Times Best Places to Work list. At the time, it was the only architecture and design firm on the list. As well, the firm I apologize, I clicked the button. <laughs> I tried to unmute you, but I cannot. I think you have to unmute yourself, Lisa. I cannot unmute you. I made a mistake. I really apologize for that. Elizabeth, I'm not sure if I'm gonna make you co-host next time. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> I'm sure we'll be back soon. No, no, no. There she is. All there right. I am. Okay. My bad. <laughs> Just when you were about to do your speaking role. Okay, take myself. <laughs> take take two. So EHDD. So I'm going to show you just highlights. So as I was saying, the firm landed on the best places to work list. It was the only architecture and design firm at the time. And it also placed in two categories in Architect Magazine's top 50. It, it, I think it was second in sustainability and 22nd in design. As well, because we were still doing business operating as usual, the firm also secured major projects with um, SFMOMA, 
the California court system, UC Merced, and the California Science Center, among other projects that it won. Now, the thing I love about this case study is it's an example for me of how technical staff gets involved and really how it takes a village to achieve results, especially if your goals are significant. And um, Elizabeth was really instrumental in supporting uh, the rebranding and, and all the other efforts because she oversaw technical staff. So um, I would go into her office and ask her if she could um, allocate uh, staff time, technical staff time. But I think, and, and Elizabeth um, will agree with me on this because we've talked about this, is the commitment that the principals have in terms of exposing the technical staff to marketing and BD in a, in a, for an architecture firm, I think is very valuable knowledge and experience. And the technical staff would be involved in everything from proposal generation and creation to interview prep to actually observing at client interviews. Wouldn't you say, Elizabeth? I fully agree. I mean, as director of practice, I was part of the firm's so-called office management or, or OMT team, and that made the firm's decision. And the firm had, however, very implemented a very collaborative process of strategic groups advising OMT on three of the four business areas other than finance. And, and knowing that this effort needed more hands than Lisa's marketing team had, technical staff was added to most marketing, uh, marketing efforts during that period. And beyond that, the firm was heavily investing in training its staff to be, to, to be on a leadership track, no matter where you were in the firm. The branding campaign itself was held very closely to the five owners' chests. And client, however, client and staff surveys were integrated in the process. And the outcome was that staff was extremely proud of the message, the look, look on, of the logo, the website, the awards, no matter what. Um, it, it really felt like everybody had almost inhaled that whole process. Yeah, that's a good point. And I think this is an example also where your marketing team really can be your cheerleading squad as well. Um, and I remember we would have during the staff meetings, we would really talk about where we were in the process and what we needed um, the rest of the team to do. So to Elizabeth's point, everybody was on board one, but also everybody was ex excited and at the end of the day, proud of the results. So it might seem like a very expensive way to boost morale or to sustain morale, but a rebranding effort really can be a very um, powerful and impactful process if it's appropriate. So this is a case of a firm that wanted to grow and Elizabeth actually brought me on board for this project for the first part of it. This was another multi-year project and she was principal at Launi Arc. This is the consultant team and my role in the beginning was to help with brand strategy and uh, content strategy as well. I brought on board a photographer and the website designer. And Elizabeth will tell you more about the firm profile in a few, but I just wanted to mention something. The firm, had great assets in terms of solid client relationships and a founder who is a rainmaker, probably the ultimate rainmaker. So the networking part was really dialed in. And these are just some um, results. Now, I mentioned earlier that when a firm is growing or that's your goal, you may or may not be doing PR. But in this case, we did a little bit of it and I was able to secure a profile for the founder in the Business Times. And we also did a PR campaign around Elizabeth joining the firm to help take them to the next level. My takeaway from this case study, it's one of my favorite case studies, is that the rebranding was taken from online to on-site. And by that, I mean, at least at the time the website was launched, the look, the feel, the vibe of that website was really reflected and carried through to the physical office. And Elizabeth can tell us a little bit more about that and also the firm profile. Happy to do so. So my first step as principal and managing director was to develop a strategic plan for this 10 year old entrepreneurial firm to double in size over two years turning it into a Mayrake firm. Simultaneous investment in all four areas of the firm were key to the success. Operationally, I was 
technically the CEO. I hired everybody involved in the growth and managed the growth wisely. So I hired an interior design firm to create the vision for the new office, combined with a strategic hire of a senior interior designer that oversaw its implement implementation on staff. On the brand side, I hired Lisa and her team to rebrand the firm's logo and website with a new mission and vision statement. And Ken and I invested heavily into business development in initiatives that allowed for the growth. On the finance side, I added a consulting CFO to work with the internal controller um, and setting up and meeting benchmarks. On the practice and design side, I hired a design and technical director, a studio director, housing projects, several project managers and senior designers to oversee the teams. So the firm grew from 18 to 36 staff over two years while remaining highly profitable and changing its profile from a large retail development, suburban retail development uh, profile to a urban infill housing pro uh, uh, firm that was actually also elevating its design profile heavily at that time. Um, but it was only doable, workable because we were a very close knit team and we invested in all four areas of the firm simultaneously, which is taxing on everybody, but a lot of fun. Everybody was on board. Staff was super thrilled to see the new offices and the website and everything happening at the same time. And one of the other things I am remembering, Elizabeth, is the investment in photography. And my memory of, of you and Ken, especially Ken, he was not tied to any project photography. He wasn't nostalgic about any project photography. He just said, if it doesn't work, if it's not working for where we need to go, let's reshoot. And we did. We, we did. We had a fantastic photographer on our team, Thomas Heinzer. I agree. Yeah. Okay, great. So this is our last case study. The goal here is to create buzz, but uh, a happy result of it as well was uh, gaining prestige. And this is a client, uh, design agency co-client. Design agency is a PR firm founded by Aaron Cullerton, who was the AIASF deputy director. And I collaborate with her. I've known Aaron for a very long time and we are collaborators as well. So this is WDA William Duff Architects out of San Francisco. And I believe Sarah Murgy, their business development and marketing director is in the audience, as well as Wendy Osaki, marketing manager. So this is the leadership team. That's the uh, marketing team. This is the consultant team. So in creating Buzz, uh, we, because of that goal, we decided to double track uh, PR and marketing to support their business development efforts. This firm is, I believe, third, closing probably on, closing in on 40 employees. They are on their 22nd year. The founder, William Duff, is still very actively involved in the firm, but it has a very um, flat organizational structure, uh, I would say. And they work on airport amenities projects, residential, commercial, and retail. So the firm had great assets as well. They already had a, a solid website. They had already made the right investments in project photography, hiring uh, very good photographers. And they also had recently published a book that codified their design uh, philosophy. The book is called Design Vision. So we, were, we came in with uh, the client already have, uh, having uh, all these assets. Now, this is an ongoing engagement uh, going on four years now. And so I will show you just highlights of results. So in terms of uh, PR, which is the primary way that Buzz uh, was cre is being created, we were able to secure placement for projects in these publications among many other publications, including a cover story in California Home and Design Magazine. The firm, similar, similarly to EHDD, also landed on the San Francisco Business Times Best Places to Work list in 2020. They were the only architecture design firm on the list. And I think they are vying for a spot on that list once again this year. And also we advised on awards strategy that resulted in a win of one of their projects for, uh, from AIA San Francisco. And we also advised on events strategy and helped create or, or co-create 
events where their leadership could speak as well as um, events where their leadership could be invited to speak. I will say about gaining prestige, it could be earned and it could be manufactured. And by that, I mean a legacy firm that's been around for 60 years, maybe just by nature of it being around for that long has a reputation that might give it prestige. Whereas an entrepreneurial or maverick firm may have to manufacture that prestige. And manufacturing in, in this case is not a bad word. It just means you are speeding up that process. But also it means that you have a good foundation from which to speed up that process and WDA does. The thing about landing on a best places to work list is very competitive and like I said, in the history of this list, the recent history of this list, I think there have only been three other, um, EHDD, WDA, and one other firm have landed on this list. So it's, it's a very tough list for an architecture and design firm to get on, but WDA has made a commitment to its firm culture and its employees that I think enabled um, or facilitated their landing on this list. So that takes us, you know, all the case studies require a commitment of time, of money. And some of you might be asking, what's it going to cost? How much does this cost? And to that, I'll say your budget reflects your values. Your marketing budget reflects your values. That's not an original thought. It's a thought that's held by many others. And by that, I mean those line items will reflect what you want done and how you want done, how you want to sell your story. And these are just four examples of marketing initiatives that you could spend your money on depending on your goals, depending on your budget, depending on your bandwidth depending again on where your firm is in its life cycle. And Elizabeth and I have had conversations about this because having been in-house on a marketing team and now uh, as a consultant to clients, I would prefer that the marketing budget be healthy. And by that, I mean eight to 12% of gross revenue. But Elizabeth, of course, because she is uh, in, in charge of business strategy has um, other thoughts about that. Do you wanna share? Well, I mean, I advise my clients to target between five and 12% of the net revenues to marketing efforts, including, including staff time uh, dedicated to marketing. And my experience is, to be honest, that not many firms do invest that amount of, of their income on marketing. And I believe it's, 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 it's a good uh, return on your investment if you do so. If you do it wisely, as you will lay out in a minute, because <clears throat> there are different strategies possible on how to invest. Yeah, and I really think this is where your business plan is really, really important because your business plan can determine realistically how much you can spend on marketing. And then from there, you can figure out what are my priorities? What do I value? But if someone was to ask me, well, where should I spend my money? What's the best story selling tool? My answer would be photography. Invest in really good photography, and here's why. If you look at that yoga triangle of sorts, you're going to need good photography for business development, for your proposals and for your presentations. You're certainly going to need good photography for any PR investment that um, you might be thinking of making. And you will most definitely need your good photography for marketing for your website, for your social media feed, for your blog posts, and even for award submissions. By the way, I want to put a plug in. Corinne uh, reminded us yesterday that the Residential Architecture Awards um, submission process registration is still open. So for those of you that are eligible, head over to their website after this presentation. But to go back to what I was saying, invest in good photography. And if there is a way you can trade services perhaps with a good photographer, as, as long as it's the best photographer for your budget is, is my recommendation. And for some firms, don't be afraid to hire a photographer, a good photographer who can challenge your thinking about your project, who might have a different perspective on how a project might be photographed because that dialogue, that back and forth, when it happens can result in really, really great photography, memorable, iconic photography. People at the end of the day may not remember your logo, hopefully they will, but they might remember a photograph. So what's next? Think about your brand in terms of a traffic signal. Green is on brand, red is off brand. 
So when you're thinking about initiatives and where to spend your time and money, think about, is it on brand? Is it off brand? And then that yellow light in the middle is really your play area, your think time area where you can explore and see how you can push and evolve your brand, get it to the next level. Thank you. Well, thank you, Lisa, for this wonderful presentation. I wanted to encourage everybody to um, ask us some questions uh, related to the topic of the day, story selling and the freestyle practice, so we can um, and, uh, understand what, where your thinking is at. I also wanted to encourage everybody, of course, to um, continue uh, with the series. Uh, we, the upcoming TTT series continues in May with a leadership kind of session. Um, we will lay open how business structure, culture, and firm management are intertwined with leadership coaching and also how it ties into, in this, into the strategic plan of a firm. So we have one good question from Sarah. Sarah, if you want to unmute yourself and elaborate on the question about photography with or without people. Well, I really, first of all, thank you, Lisa. I really agree about the photography. I think that's really important. And there's always a, a question. There's this without photography, without people or with people. And there's, they, it's very divided. And, you know, coming from a brand strategist perspective, what would you recommend, Lisa? So if you're photographing commercial projects and you want it to be an interior design magazine, I would look at the style of photography that interior design magazine has set their photography standards. And typically they have, they use people to suggest energy. So it's usually a blur, although I've seen photographs in interior design where uh, people actually are in the photo post, but in, I think for commercial projects where you want to show interaction of space, if you're photographing an airport, for example, it's impossible to not have people in there. So commercial projects could probably benefit from having people in them as long as they are placed with purpose. Um, otherwise, it can be distracting and it can also be, it can also date your project because clothing, hairstyle, all those can be indicators of when a project was photographed. And so for commercial projects, you wanna be very careful. For residential, I typically advise to not include photos uh, of people in the projects, but rather create that suggestion of life and energy through very thoughtful styling. And by thoughtful styling, I mean, please don't throw another rug or throw, please don't throw another throw on the sofa for the sake of having and thinking that styling. It means um, deliberate styling to create some kind of life, suggestion of life in the project. Great, we actually have a lot of questions come in. Um, so, and just a reminder, we do have to wrap this up right at 9.30 today. So we'll try to get to as many as possible. Um, uh, one question from Human, if you want to unmute yourself about high quality renderings um, are in the same category with photography. Sure, you know, as to an eye of an architect, when I go on a website and I see real photos of a building built versus a, a rendering, to me, it looks much different, right? Because what's, that's, what's one of them is real, the other one is not. How do you, how do you see these two? I see them as part of your visual assets. So photography, renderings, and video are, are very important visual assets to have, um, but each has a different purpose. And so renderings and sketches, for example, and even sketches are, are, are have a different purpose. Renderings might serve you well if you are presenting uh, to a group of developers, for example, or to a community where they need to see, where they need to visualize in 3D what the project is going to be. Um, sketches are more evocative, so they tend to um, convey the vision for a project versus the actual project, whereas photography is the, you know, the actual uh, capturing. So I would say if you can make an investment um, 
in photography, that would be the start because if your goal is PR, then typically photography is what the assets, those are the assets required. But don't shy away from investing in sketches or renderings or you know, 3D modeling that you can show on your website as long as they are very professionally done. I've seen renderings, for example, that just look like they're cobbled together and they're not very sophisticatedly done. Um, it's a story selling tool. And so you want that tool to convey a certain level of not only aesthetic, but also uh, vision and, and vocabulary. Great question. Um, next one from Andy about um, how can projects publish that are, how can get them published if they're unbuilt? And Andy, if you want to unmute yourself. Hi, uh, Lisa. Good morning. Um, Good morning. Yeah, uh, I mean, we've had some very exciting projects that either we've just, um, they're on the boards, they're not quite built. We want to, I mean, it's a great time to market and, and uh, uh, sell those to, but, uh, you know, there's about a year or two of construction that uh, lag. Um, we've had trouble getting uh, projects published that aren't photographed. Uh, the, you know, they're just renderings. So um, uh, you want to speak to that? Sure. And this is related actually to Human's question about uh, uh, renderings. Yes. So unbuilt work can be tricky because as you pointed out, and as I mentioned, photographs are what, you know, the editors want to see photographs. With that said, a couple of things. There are publications where you can get unbuilt work published, but this is where the investment in really good renderings or really good sketches um, come into play. And the second part of my answer has to do with self-publishing. So you can, in this day and age, there's no longer that absolute reliance on a third party to publish your project. You have a website, you have a blog, some of you may have a YouTube channel. So there are other ways that you can communicate about this unbuilt work. But I will put a caveat on both built and unbuilt work. Not all of your projects are going to be worthy of editorial placement. Some projects um, simply belong in your portfolio where you're presenting it to potential clients. Some projects could sit in that middle ground where they're good for your website, but they're also great for um, publication. So part of the work that I do with clients is an assessment of which projects belong where. And I'll also say something about unbuilt work. If it is very special, if it is very significant to your firm, then you can engage in a PR strategy that starts almost from the beginning of that project through sketches and renderings, and you just kind of follow that thread until the project is built. But that requires an investment. And that I would only suggest that if the project is really going to be a crown jewel in your portfolio. Really great questions on getting down to the nitty gritty. Lisa, do you have time for these last two questions or we need to wrap it up? Um, I have time, thank you. Okay, great. Um, so there's one from Bogdan. Um, can you talk about um, how to find and interview a PR firm? Great question. So that's a tricky question. Um, some PR activity is done in-house for firms that can afford to have a staff. And the EHDD um, marketing team, actually, we also handled all the PR internally, but that was a unique situation. In terms of finding the right fit, um, it's not dissimilar from clients finding the right residential architect, for example. Um, you have to have a good personality fit. You have to have a good fit in terms of budget because PR services can range. Um, but also think about engaging in PR as something that doesn't necessarily have to be a retainer, although most PR engagements have to be on retainer because sometimes it can take a long time to get results. But if you have one project, for example, you're just testing the waters, then you can um, engage in a short term. You, you can uh, do a PR engagement short term. Now, questions to ask the potential PR consultant, how do they work? Um, who else are they working with? Um, you might want to ask questions on photography. What is their philosophy on photography? So just probe. And I think at the end of the day, it's important for your PR consultant potentially to tell you you're not ready. 
or you are you know, uh, pre-PR, as Aaron and I have um, told some potential clients with whom we've done business development, you're not ready for PR. Instead, what you need to do is focus on marketing, specifically get your website redone, get your projects photographed. So a good uh, publicist or PR consultant can tell you whether or not you are ready or whether or not they have enough assets from you, enough projects that they think they can shop around. Great. Um, and just one last question, Andy, did you want to unmute yourself again? Um, what is the ROI of getting published in PR campaigns? <laughs> Yeah, it's just I, obviously there's a one, two, five, ten, twenty thousand dollar investment, whatever, yeah. of time and money. And yeah, um, you know, it's different to invest in marketing versus business development, where you can see uh, you have a hit rate of one out of three or one out of ten. Um, so I, I, we all have a have an ego involved, uh, a pride of our our creative work, and we want to get published. But uh, in terms of a business and of, of looking at how, you know, the success, if, you know, you talked about all these different firms getting awards and um, published. Um, does it lead to getting more work uh, or better work or better fees? I guess those three. <laughs> does it lead to getting better work, better fees? I would say if you wanted me to give an absolute answer, no. <laughs> because the, the reality of marketing is it builds your brand. It is not prime. It's not primarily a business development tool. It's that yoga pose of warrior too, where you're positioning yourself to get work. Whereas business development is a very proactive way of getting work. So I would say, you know, investing is really going to be dependent on how much money you can realistically spend. But with that said, the ROI on PR, for example, you could spend, let's just assume the average um, monthly retainer for a good PR firm will range from 4,500 to 5,500 a month. And typically you wanna do a full year engagement, maybe longer. But if you get a cover story in Dwell, for example, with a six page spread or an eight page spread, um, I've seen 12 pages in Lux Magazine, that alone has paid for your PR investment in terms of the value of that coverage. Never mind that that print coverage is going to be typically accompanied by online where you have hundreds of thousands of eyeballs looking at your work. So when you think about PR in terms of I've spent $60,000 for one year, but I got um, one article, I landed the cover, and it was a 12 page spread. You multiply those 12 pages by the um, ad rate, the open, this is how I, you know, it's done. You open, you multiply the 12 pages by the ad rate of that um, magazine. For example, let's just assume it's $2,000 for um, per page. So that's 12 pages is 24. And then the cover really is very valuable. It's almost, um, how do you place, um, a value on, on cover. And then you have the online coverage on top of that. So for that one invest for that investment of one year, getting that one project in the right publication um, really could, could be a good return on your investment because there's nothing more um, reinforcing to your credibility and your reputation than third party coverage. Advertising is great, but that's still money that you've paid for. Whereas PR really is about an editor vetting your work um, and other people, your peers and potential clients seeing that vetting process in print. Well, thanks so much for all the questions, everyone. It really adds a lot to the presentation to get down to the nitty gritty of things. Um, so we're gonna wrap it up and I believe we're handing it off to Elizabeth. Well, thank you again, everybody, so much for attending today's event. I hope you got uh, a lot of insight and inspiration on how you can make bring that make that work for your firm. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to remind you, attending this event and future events will help you create your own business plan or refine it if you have it. So I. Hope to see you soon again. If you want to have more information about past events that were tying into this, please see my website, um, 
where the Vimeo video is posted. Thank you so much, Lisa, for this absolutely um, inspiring presentation today. And I hope to see you so soon. Bye-bye.